Jumping in, another Best Ball Mania draft, trying to win $3 million. That's what we're doing today on Stealing Bananas. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find my Stealing Signals newsletter at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his great work at Road of His. I'm excited for this one, Sean. We've done a few, but we've started talking, done a few drafts, trying to draft maybe like once a week just to get some of these drafts in. Our high six drafts are coming just Talk through our picks, get ready, get some reps in, get some reps together, drafting together. Um, so hopefully the, the listeners are enjoying this. I, I heard some feedback that it feels like it's more drafting on, on our channel this year, but that's probably because it has been. But, Sean, I'm excited for this one because the last couple episodes, we really focused on some macro stuff. And one of my favorite things about drafting with you is that – I mean, we, we do think about things very similarly, but also because we spend so much time talking through concepts, you're very aware of like what my arguments are. You actually like, you know, you, you listen very well in our, in our conversations. And so you suggest things during the drafts that are sort of applications of things that sometimes that you know that I like. And, and I'm often like excited to hear sort of your takes on on sort of some of my arguments, if that makes sense. But um, I'm, I'm, we've talked about a lot over these last couple, so I'm excited to hear where you might want to go with that. And I know you'll incorporate some of my thoughts into it as well. It's going to be a, it's going to be a blast to draft this in the next few squads. Yeah. I mean, doing all this drafting gives us a chance to work through the projections, the rankings, and then tactics. Once you get into the actual situation, how you want it to play out. And so one of the things that we do during these drafts is talk a lot about individual players, which I mean, so much of fantasy football does still come down to that and needs to come down to that. That's one of the things that we have so much fun with. Ben, I do have my updated rankings loaded in today. So that will be (laughs) a little bit of an additional bonus there for anyone watching online. You were about to have your rankings come out on stealing signals. And by the time this releases, they may be either just come out or will be just about to come out. So we're excited for those. We're also excited because this is more or less the last underdog draft that will occur before we have some real preseason games. The games are going to start in just a handful of minutes here. So we're also fired up for preseason starting. I can't wait to watch some of those this evening. Let's jump into this draft and see what we get. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, the, 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 the preseason being here, coming in hot and heavy, is exciting. I mean, we have um, – I mean, I, I, I'm still getting used to the the three-game preseason where we're getting some of the starters starting in, in preseason week one. And, um, you know, teams are not playing it the same way. They're, they're kind of thinking, okay, well, we'll play our guys in preseason week one and week two, and then kind of sit in preseason week three before the season starts. So we get to see a little bit more right off the bat. You know, usually you get a week of the not important preseasons as it were. Sean, we drew the one one So this will be a fun one. I don't think we've done too high of a draft pick together yet. I think we did a one Oh three fairly recently. Uh, but I, yeah, I've been loving the one-on-one I've gotten more than my fair share in B- the BBM. And then that's been fun. Um, I really like the two, three turn the four, five turn a little bit more annoying, but still usually like where I'm at six, seven turn pretty wide receiver, good range, um, wide receiver friendly the range. And then like where I'm at when I'm getting into those middle rounds that are tough, we are going to take, I, I usually go Jefferson. I don't know if you're waiting on my thoughts on that, but yeah, we are going to go Jefferson, but yeah, the two, three is, uh, you talked about in your apex draft the last time we were on together, you went running back, running back there. I've done Jefferson with, uh, Hall and Stevenson, like you did in that draft, just to, to build some anchors, uh, anchor running backs in, you know, it being a, a best ball draft, obviously that four or five turns really the big one. I think for how, how these teams built. Cause you, you obviously you can also go Jefferson. If you get a chance to get Devonta Smith or, or T Higgins, you could go potentially three straight receivers to start as well. There's various ways to go. You can get an elite quarterback if you want. Um, but that four or five turn is where it's tricky. I think um, 
what are your? I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned this to you recently, but I, I've had a hard time with some of those um, drafts and, and being in that spot. I, I've done a little bit of McLaurin and Iuke lately as a little mini correlation. I did finally do my first Fields and DJ Moore stack together, Sean, which literally was my first one. I think it was about my 80th draft. I have been pretty vocal about not being super in on that stack together. I have a, more fields than than more this year, but yeah, it's a it's a tough range depending on the receivers that make it there. Yeah, so we look at the normal ADP here and T Higgins possibility coming back to us at the two three turn. I think that would be interesting. Maybe a little bit more difficult now with Jonathan Taylor continuing to slide with that news there, but you mentioned coming back up a four or five turn, the different options you can potentially get locked out of even some of those picks. Ben, it's been interesting drafting in apex, obviously the really cool format that Mike Brody has put together. And when you get the experts in there, it always kind of cracks me up because there's a gold rush for whatever the premium position in any given year is. And you know how I don't like to chase points and don't like to participate in these gold rushes even if it's for the position that i have kind of argued is the most important in fantasy then i have taken five running backs in my first seven picks wow how many can you play it's a you can it's play best three ball. so it's, it's best ball right no it's it's going to be managed and so oh, okay. the other element of it is that it does allow for trades and so i think that that element is a lot of fun if you get boxed out at a certain position, you know, maybe you have someone who's in a different area of the draft who gets boxed out where they are and you can work out something with them later. But I had told you the other day that when I selected Ramondre Stevenson and Brees Hall at the two, three turn that the next couple of backs, not the next couple of picks just overall that I was looking at were Jameer Gibbs and Travis Etienne. One of those guys came back to me. So I did take Etienne along with Jackson Smith and Jigba and then the next turn, all of the wide receivers were wiped out. Quentin Johnston selected right ahead of me. So I went ahead and took J.K. Dobbins and Javante Williams. We'll see if I'm able to unload any of those players. It. We'll see if three of the five hit. Because really kind of what you're doing from a starting perspective is you're hoping that three of the five do hit. And you can dominate running back one, dominate running back two, dominate the flex. One of the things that we talk about big picture, Ben, and is definitely a appropriate in these underdog drafts is that even if you end up with great running back value, you could only play three at most and you have to fill three wide receiver slots. So you have the half PPR. That element doesn't necessarily give you as much scoring from the receiver position. Maybe you're thinking in 2023, I actually want to go running back heavy. I want my flex spot to be a running back, but we keep getting back to this issue of the mixed incentives and the fact that you do have to play Three wide receivers, there are only so many running backs you can get in your starting lineup. Yeah, certainly. That's uh that's fun. We'll get back into that. We are about on the clock. Taylor does go. Alave, Devonta Smith go. Uh T. Higgins is there. I'm very into that. Who do you like here? Well, we go with Stevenson. We can reach for Debo a little bit. We can go with Brees Hall. We can go with Mark Andrews. I like all three of those guys. I think I'm probably Ramondre at this moment. I mean, I have a lot of Brees Hall, but just a little bit of concern with him. And obviously he falls and, and you can get exposure to him. I mean, you can get exposure to him in the fourth round right now. So there's not really a huge rush to take him at the 301 necessarily. Um, so yeah, the start of Justin Jefferson, T Higgins and Ramondre Stevenson feels nice. I'm taking a lot of Stevenson too. really like him in this range. I do think they're going to add somebody. I'm not, I, I guess I wouldn't describe myself as super concerned when they do. I mean, we, we talked recently, he, he caught like 60 something balls last year, 69 balls. And, uh, people are really concerned about how he's not going to get enough receiving. And I mean, it just... I'm uh, okay betting on the guy who caught 69 passes last year to catch passes again this year, I guess. Yeah, I don't know why the receiving element would be a concern. I would think there'd be a lot more of an issue where if they do end up with one of these other sort of three down backs that you could see, you know, 50 carries 
get taken away. And 50 carries, even if they're mostly of the low value touch variety, which is kind of what we hypothesized on our previous show. Ben Ramondre Stevenson, one of the headliners of our most recent podcast, we talked through the 2023 running back landscape from a couple of different perspectives. Number one, from the perspective of how the position has evolved over the last four or five years, the AEP landscape now, but also the macro trends that we've been kind of doing a series on, how they relate to the running back position, and whether the actual decline in workload and scoring is the result of that or is the result of some of these running back injuries. Obviously, it's probably a little bit of a mix, but I'm actually okay making a bet on running back scoring, maybe not even bouncing back in a big way, but certainly not further deteriorating. Ramondre Stevenson looks like the guy to me who is the best bet that this combination of safest and then still decent upside to outperform his draft slot when we're looking at guys being drafted in rounds two or three. Yeah, he, that's exactly the way I would put it. I feel like I feel pretty comfortable about his workload. I know, you know, Belichick running back scare people, but I mean, I feel pretty, pretty comfortable about, um, how that's going to work play out. I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying that there, there isn't um, a long history of Belichick doing various things with running backs, but when he's had like clear lead backs, he's leaned into them at times, including Stevenson last year. And they were willing to let Harris walk and they have not added anyone. And it's, you know, we're well into August now. And they, I mean, it's Ty Montgomery and, and Pierre strong and Kevin Harris that are his competition I think all signals right now are pointing to, hey, we are very comfortable with Ramondre Stevenson being our main running back this season and kind of leaning into him. I looked through some of Belichick's history. We remember a lot of the years where it was kind of unclear, but, you know, early career, uh, Stephen Ridley had a big season. I always remember uh, Corey Dillon having a huge workload with the Patriots. I went back and looked. That was really early in, in his career, but uh, in, in Belichick's career, but you also have like Lawrence Maroney when he came up, had some, some big workloads at times and was sort of more the guy for a, pre, for a period of time. Um, and there's at least one or two more that aren't, aren't coming to my mind immediately, but I mean, I just, I don't, I guess I don't buy that. Like Belichick is, the, is, uh, as a coach wants committees as much as he sort of was one of the first people that was not spending a ton of capital on running back and hitting the position with multiple bodies and, and sort of, you know, those things. And then the best man for that given week would be, you know, the, the guy that would, would, would play and, and they would go with it. But if they're in a position now where they got this hit on a, you know, a round four running back and he's going into year three and looks like a star and they don't have to pay him any, you know, extra money or anything like that. Like they're going to just ride him. I just, I mean, I, I don't really understand the, the 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 logic otherwise, any more so than I guess any other back, especially because as we've pointed out, he's been very good the last couple of years in a lot of the advanced metrics. I think that's the easy thing to miss is that Ramondre Stevenson is the best running back that Belichick has had. He is hit on the type of talent level and upside that they were wanting when they drafted Lawrence Maroney. Now, times have changed significantly since then, but when you get a player like that who allows you to run your offense without tipping things and is just the best player to be out there if you do want to be balanced, we expect this Patriots offense to be a lot more dynamic in 2023, but at the same time, we don't expect them to you know, start checking caution to the wind and out there guns blazing everything a passing play this is going to be a balanced offense where the talent of the running back is going to play a big role in whether or not they're successful absolutely sean we are almost back on the clock it is it, it is striking to see your ranks here relative to to adp i'm, I'm curious who the best available players are in adp because as we approach this four or five turn the only guys I can see on your list are all, they all have ADPs that are significantly lower than where we actually are in the draft. Um, we are on deck. I like the guys that you have at the top. I, I mean, do you just want to take those? We have uh, Brandon Ayuk and Jackson Smith and Jigba at the top of your queue for the people that are not watching us on YouTube. A reminder, you always can be watching the draft along with us on YouTube. I, I like those two names. 
I I assume Fields went off, right? I know you like he did. He went in the third round of this draft. Okay. And so we didn't have a shot at him. The two best names by ADP are Drake London and Joe Burrow. We could have gone with London more at the turn here. Obviously, those guys had the week 17 against each other. We just selected Brandon Ayuk. For me, this one does come down to JSN or putting Joe Burrow with T. Higgins. Oh, I like the Burrow move too. But JSN was I was comfortable with. I, I don't like London or Moore here. Yeah, so my my issue with Moore is I, I want to stack him with Fields or I, I basically don't want to be taking him. I do not. I, I genuinely don't see tournament winning ceiling for him that doesn't include even bigger ceiling for Justin Fields is sort of the way that I would put it. Like, I, I think if you're playing in a in a best ball mania, a, a, a league this big, the upside scenarios for more. I mean, obviously, like, Fields could get hurt, and I, I guess, and their backup quarterback could be the one that unlocks more. I don't know. I mean, you could have some really weird scenarios, but if Moore is hitting a lot of these upside scenarios along with Fields rushing, like, it means Fields is a really good quarterback play. So I like to play more through Fields and more to have an impact on – the, the Bears passing offense through fields and sometimes not even stacking the two of them. Or if I am going to get more, I want to have fields with it. Cause I think that's, you know, something where more ceiling outcomes are included. If you're, I think if you're not playing fields to be a complete smash in that range by stacking them together, then more is probably worth He's probably overdrafted by a couple of rounds still is, is where I land. We've talked about that a lot. Um, JSN, we get him at the 4-5. You mentioned in that Apex draft, I was going to say, as you were going through that, surprising that you were able to get him at 4-5 because you it's a very wide receiver heavy draft. By the time you got back at 6-7, Quinn Johnson was gone. And, and you were talking about, I mean, part of the reason you took the five running backs in seven rounds was because the wide receivers were completely wiped out. You were looking at, J.K. Dobbins and Javante Williams. Our audience, a lot of your drafts are not going to look like that. So Sean's not saying to draft five running backs in seven rounds. That's a scenario where we're talking about the wide receiver window, like basically closing in the sixth round in some respects. And Sean having the opportunity to take some running backs that are going to go well before the wide receiver window closes in most drafts when there really wasn't a wide receiver opportunity cost. So that's why you took your fourth and your fifth as you described it. But to get JSN at the four or five in that in that build is pretty fun because I mean that's somebody we were willing to take here in a much more normal environment. Um, yeah, I mean you, I like that team as you were talking through it. It has been a fun team, and JSN does I think fall in expert leagues. It, expert leagues are pretty interesting because they kind of fit in between what you see from like aggressive underdog high stakes drafters who are very in on the breakout players and the contingent upside versus what you might see in FFPC that tends to be fairly conservative. And some of those players fall even a little bit further, but this is a full year single league setup. And so from that perspective, you can understand people being a little bit more conservative Evan Silva did select both DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett before I made the JSN pick. It's interesting in terms of those, uh, you mentioned again, the wide receiver window. Immediately before I selected Dobbins and Williams as the running back 19 and 20, Quentin Johnston had gone as the wide receiver 43. So you have 43 <laughs> wide receivers before you get to the 20th running back. Then one of the things I liked about what we did that hasn't exactly worked out, which I think is too bad, but when you take Ayuk and JSN at the 4-5 turn right there, it sets up beautifully for Pickens and Dotson coming back at 6-7. Pickens goes early in this one. He goes at the 6-0-2. That kind of bums me out. But it's one of the reasons why you would look at JSN there. One of the issues with JSN, if you're trying to put him specifically with Pickens, which is probably the best way to play it, is that you're going to have to reach for one of the two guys. And if you get there at the four or five turn and you don't like the other options, then you know make that the spot where you reach, so you don't have to reach on Pickens. That makes it's sense. just kind of big picture, like right? Because we're not yeah. just talking about this draft. You're going to have, say, you have ten drafts. You've got some different spots. This is the prime opportunity to do it. Unfortunately, it didn't play out that way. It, it makes sense at the four five turn if you're not really in love with those options. 
the one you know the one alternative was you know Burrow to, to pair with Higgins. I do like a couple other ways of playing Pittsburgh. I mean, I'm, I'm still very into Pat Frymuth and Jalen Warren later, Sean, as ways that we can bring back on JSN. I that Seattle Pittsburgh game is one of the one of the ones that I have most stacked up in these underdogs because I, I do think there's a lot of combinations and ways that you can get there that are pretty darn enticing we're almost back up Dotson's still there i'm totally with you on him as another receiver we have the one running back Ramondre stevenson four receivers already but by the time we get back up at the end of eight nine it's going to be pretty thin at receiver would like to get at least one more here probably but also kyle pitts lingering to the end of the sixth round his adp has frankly i think fallen in the last few weeks he's into the 70s now i just i don't understand why he's available in the sixth round of every draft but I have a lot of him. Very happy to take him as well as our, you know, sort of anchor tight end here. You've thrown some running backs in the queue as well that that I would be, you know, fine with in DeAndre Swift and Javante Williams. Swift getting some bad camp reports, usage reports that are concerning me a little bit. Yeah, he, well, it'll be interesting to kind of chat through what that situation is. We'll take Dotson for the first of the two picks to finish that out with Brandon Ayuk there. I think based on what you're saying, and I, and I would agree with that, the decision here is probably Kyle Pitts versus Javante Williams. We only have the one running back so far. Well, so taking a second the other, one the other thing I would The other one I would consider, I think it wouldn't be Javante for me. It'd be going all the way to a receiver for like Quentin Johnson, but I'm very fine with Pitts. I'm, I'm comfortable pushing running back in this range. I do like Javante. So we take Pitts. I like Javante and Swift enough but if i'm going to do another detour from receiver here because i know that at the eight nine turn i'm going to be comfortable with some of the running backs i typically would hit on the elite tight end there um, or else i would just take another receiver and have six through seven rounds and then you know be looking at like fryer move yeah you know in the ninth round or um the ways that you can build out your running back room in that range. Yeah, Sean, the, the Swift thing, I don't know if you had heard, but there's a couple different Eagles beats that are talking about Swift mostly only playing on passing downs, not really playing with the ones a lot, not getting a lot of rushing work. And one you know, one report that I saw was intimating that, that Penny is sort of the lead on early downs. There were other reports that are saying he's the hardest to kind of gauge. Others that are saying that he's maybe further behind what all of the reports do seem to be indicating is that Kenny Gainwell has been used a lot with the first team in a lot of different ways and more or less might be ahead of DeAndre Swift in some respects, which is, I don't know that I necessarily buy that fully. He obviously has more familiarity with the system. I think you start to see, different teams do different things with how they progress in camp. And we sometimes overreact to, to, you know, the ways that they're doing things. It wouldn't be that surprising to me if they're like, yeah, we're going to let the incumbent, even if they have sort of a plan made up in their mind that like Swift's going to play a lot in season. Yeah. We're going to let the incumbent be the lead in the early part of camp. Having said that, it's not ideal if you're taking a lot of Swift. No, I don't think it's ideal at all. I do think that, we still don't really have any idea what's going to happen. Yeah. One of the guys who I had very high exposure to last year, wrote him up multiple times during the year, featured him in the zero RB candidates countdown, and then discovered that the Eagles coaches and the team observers were very much misleading us on was Kenny Gainwell. And so I'm not saying that that's going to be the case again. Sometimes a guy arrives a year late, which can be frustrating because then you're back off of him and you miss both times. You draft him in the year where he doesn't score and then you miss your opportunity the following season. I'm not saying that Kenny Gainwell can't come on. I've liked his profile. I like his athleticism. I mean, it's a good situation there in that offense. I guess I am skeptical with the types of players that we know DeAndre Swift and Rashad Penny are that you would have a guy who last season was frequently being replaced in the situations that mattered most 
you know, to fantasy managers, but also in some of these reality situations, a guy who's being replaced by Boston Scott is suddenly going to supplant two of the better running backs in the NFL. The other thing that I've seen with Swift is that he hasn't been used a lot as a runner, but that the Eagles are actually changing their offense in a meaningful way to make sure that they involve him in the passing game and that he's getting a lot more catches than the backs have in previous seasons. So again, how much of that is true? How much of that is the fact that the Eagles have simply run a few plays for Swift and that won't actually be something that carries on into the regular season. I think those are still open questions. That's a really interesting one in terms of the projection math because they led the NFL in design QB runs by a good margin. I would imagine if they're going to be throwing more, and obviously Hertz scrambled at a, at a pretty high clip as well. If they're going to be throwing more, it comes from Hertz's rushing, uh, throwing more to the backs. It would come from Hertz's design carries even because they're probably kind of designing not necessarily screens, but maybe almost design swing passes against certain coverages, get the ball into his hands in space quickly when you are anticipating, you know, some of these cover two shells, these cover four, you know, these looks that are allowing space underneath. I think we are going to see some teams try to use the short passing game less as a check down and more as a deliberate, like we're going to get the ball to him quick. Um which we, you know, we've already seen a decent amount. We've seen jet motion tip passes. We've seen bubble screens. We've seen the motion and then, you know, return motion swing passes, like a lot of that kind of stuff. Like that, that would be when, when you say that Swift's catching a lot of passes, they're changing their offense. I would imagine it would be some of the, some of those types of things where it's like, okay, we're going to get the ball in his hands quick. He's going to be sort of the primary receiver, even though he's a running back. But to do that, you'd be talking about taking away some of Hertz's rushing. If you take away some of Hertz's rushing, I've had a hard time figuring out the top three quarterbacks for my rankings for, you know, some signal subs that are, you know, playing in leagues where they might want to decide between a premium quarterback. I think Hertz would be the QB three for me pretty easily behind Mahomes and Allen. If you're believing that logic, we are back on the clock. You have moved Bateman to the top of the queue. I really like that pick. I, I love the discount we're getting on him. You returned to practice today. Friar Muth as well. We did take Pitts. But it gives us that bring back. We would be done in tight end. I, I mean, those are two of my favorite tight ends, so I don't mind stacking them together. All these running backs you have in the queue are, are guys I really like as well. So we'll go ahead and take Bateman for the first one here. It would be a little bit of a reach on Friar Muth, but it allows us to complete that Seattle pittsburgh stack or at least set up for what we might do with quarterbacks later i think jamison williams is actually a little bit interesting here because the running backs maybe are not that appealing to me are you still in on antonio gibson with the idea that go ahead i'm pretty out on jamison i'd be fine with gibson or or aj Dillon or probably penny would be my running back but frying move is who we had at the top of the key we did run really low there and take frying you kind of talked me out of penny with your i mean we all saw the tra- <laughs> training camp news that kenny gainwell is the star yeah i don't know i just have so much penny so the, that... the, the, the 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 stuff about penny was that it was pretty uncertain about him the stuff about swift was pretty universally that they weren't using him a lot as a runner or with the first team and so I'm actually taking that as a little bit more of a interest you know interested in penny sort of read where if they're designing specific stuff in the passing game for Swift, that's interesting too. I just don't think that's the path to upside in this offense. I'm getting back to my – the first times we were talking about the Eagles backfield, Sean, I was just saying I, I liked Penny more at cost because I thought the paths to upside in this offense were through rushing efficiency essentially uh, with you know Hertz's mobility impacting that. Very similar to what Miles Sanders did last year. It's not exactly a bold take, but um, – Penny be, being the better fit for that is sort of was sort of the idea and getting him at a little bit of a discount. As we hear that these roles are sort of unsettled, I get back into I really like Penny's price and the, the potential for his fit and, and success in what should be the successful types of roles in this backfield. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I, I my view of it right now is that there's a huge risk that Penny plays the Miles Sanders role with fewer touches 
And I mean, one of the things that was a problem for Sanders last year, even though he was one of you know these dead zone league winners, yeah. is that they would take him out for Kenny, Kenny Gainwell and Boston Scott. And if they're already saying that Gainwell, number one, is the two minute back. And number two is the guy who is leading the way in the running game. Then you've got huge problems for both guys. I think that Swift has an easier path out of it because he can just do so many things. And his ability in space is more or less unparalleled among all but maybe one or two backs in the entire NFL. You've mentioned the Seattle situation a couple of times when I was reading your stealing signals post on the NFC North. And one of the things you were talking about in relationship to David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs is the fact that even though Jamal Williams took so many of those unfortunate high value touches away last season, that before Swift got in a situation where he had the shoulder and ankle issues, they were using him quite a bit more. We could see Gibbs kind of be that guy. Now Swift obviously has moved over to the Eagles. I just kind of think that one of the things that people have raised eyebrows with in New England is that they're not letting Ramondre Stevenson do a ton in practice. If you think that DeAndre Swift is your best back and you know that he has ankle and shoulder problems, it's not like they're out there hitting these running backs and, and causing injuries in that kind of deal. But I just think that one of the things that we're seeing are just the Eagles kind of bubble wrapping him for these situations that matter. But I think this conversation that you and I are having about it does underline the risk to both guys. It does. Yeah. And I think you make a good point about Sanders. I mean, Sanders was very good last year, but he wasn't, he hit on a ceiling for that profile that is in the range of outcomes and wasn't really, I mean, I, a lot of people rubbed him in with Jacobs and I made a, point a couple different ways this offseason that they were their hits were very different josh jacobs hit was more meaningful was was a much higher point uh total and and production level in terms of points per game and all of those things sanders was very good scored a lot of touchdowns as as well as the rushing efficiency but without the receiving wasn't a, a world beater necessarily um jameson Oh, does finally go. He's been a tough one for me, Sean, with the suspension, the bad camp reports, the drops, and also just thinking that their offense is so designed to send a lot of these vertical receivers deep and then throw underneath the, to Amon Ross St. Brown and and Gibbs and Laporta. Um, I just feel like he's going to get decoy treatment more than um, – is maybe fair for his talent level and those types of things. We do not have a quarterback yet. You're kind of clicking around. Um, what are you seeing from the receivers? I, I can't even remember all, every player we've drafted, but what are you seeing from our stat candidates here? Well, Dobbs would go back with Justin Jefferson as our 101. That would be kind of nice. We did get Kirk Cousins going off the board to a team that doesn't have any Vikings. So a little bit of a, not necessarily a bad selection, but just a little bit of a, an odd selection that doesn't necessarily help us out. Obviously, we've got San Francisco and Washington that we can do later. Also, we have Geno Smith is gone. He goes to the DK Metcalf manager. So those things have been eliminated for us. We also have gotten pretty healthy I wouldn't say exactly runs, but we've gotten some runs actually on the running back position that has made it a little bit more difficult here. If we were to select Jalen Warren, which I think is a guy who makes a lot of sense, it would be around ahead of ADP, but working from the edges, I mean, that's something we're going to have to deal with a little bit as we think through who we might want for these backs. Elijah Mitchell has an ADP in this range. I guess that one doesn't actually appeal to me that much, even though we have some 49ers. What are you seeing here? Do, are, do we have directions to go other than Dobbs and Warren? I think we can go those ways. The other guy I would float is Damian Harris. Uh, I really don't understand the lack of interest in him. But Dobbs and, and Warren both fit our build really well and probably make more sense. Warren gives us that bring back. The thing, I mean, Warren's ADP, he's not going to make it all the way back. I don't, I, I think it makes sense to take Warren. 
you're checking the the reports on Harris. I didn't see. I didn't know that. It said he's not practicing because of a knee thing. I didn't. I didn't see that. I, I keep hearing that we need to be worried about Harris because of Latavius Murray. I think in this range of running backs, you need to be asking yourself questions about what happens if it breaks right, not um, worrying about these you know small little reports about things that go wrong, unless those are really legitimately concerning. For me, when I look at the Bills depth chart, I know you're really high on James Cook, Sean, and I can see it sounds like he's leading everything. And I can see him being the main guy and, and being fantastic. But I do really feel that their addition of Dalton Kincaid and the way that they're moving their slot position into a big tight end position as opposed to the Cole Beasley type in the past. And that was something they said right away. They're, I do think they're going to have some some formations where they bring both tight ends out there. They ask the defense to match. When the defense doesn't match, they're going to run with two tight ends on the field. And, you know, a lot of these scheme things that we've talked about, Sean, it's it's a, it's a way to sort of try to bully opponents out of that by leaning into the fact that teams are going to let you run. They're going to run even harder at you in even bigger formations until you put an extra linebacker or, you know, front seven guy on the field, defensive lineman, whatever. And then you can split Kincaid out, break the huddle from the same 12 formation and use Kincaid as a slot receiver and throw the ball and you have a mismatch now their secondary is is weakened and all of those things i think part of that whole idea with the kincaid move you see both harris and latavius murray get brought in this offseason and you're like okay well those are the types of running backs that fit this sort of power running back idea i do think cooks i don't think that's going to be a big part of their offense i think it's like a very small part of their offense certain packages and cooks a better fit for most of what they're going to do but i do think one of the other backs is probably going to get into some of those spots and they might have some matchups where they do that a little bit more than others and maybe late in the year if you're talking about buffalo games maybe they get a snow game and so you're talking about okay harris versus murray and i see the concerns about murray but murray's going to turn 34 in january sean he's 34 not like 31 He's as old as like when we were saying how old Frank Gore was when Gore was still lingering, you know, like, I mean, he's closer to 35 than to 30. And we talk about 30 as a death knell for backs. Damian Harris has been efficient as a runner every year. He's been pretty good as a receiver. Even he's gotten uh, accolades as well as a pass blocker. And so I've talked a little bit this off season about maybe he would be playing on passing downs a little He's uh, an interdivision signing. We often see that where like the team has played against him two years, two times a year for the last several years, knows him well. It's a little concerning that they're talking about Latavius Murray and camp, but like I'm still very comfortable betting on Damian Harris to be the number two here. I think you would have to expect over a long timeline, the much younger back that has been better in recent seasons. Um, he's 26. He'll turn 27 in February. So he's just a bit more than seven years younger than Latavius Murray. And he's 20, 26, 27, which is still getting up there in, in running back years. So anyway, two years ago, Sean, we thought Latavius Murray was basically washed when he was in Baltimore. He couldn't beat out Devonta Freeman. That Baltimore team was really struggling. Last year, he has some moments with Denver. And, and I don't know. I've just... I'm not really that concerned about Damian Harris, I guess, and, and and what his role might be. I'm hearing a lot of negativity about that and why you shouldn't draft him as a result. And then I'm thinking about, well, I mean, this is a range of drafts where we should be thinking about what what do we get when we're right on these players? Because we're going to cut a lot of these guys. I mean, obviously in, in best ball, it's different. But as we start to get into managed leagues and everything, what do we get when we're right? I mean – in the, in the case of Harris, I think uh, the upside is still very clear in this offense. Could get you know a lot of touchdowns, a lot of a lot of potential for decent games in in half PPR. Anyway, he's a guy that I I feel like I'm on an island about because I, I see him his ADP falling, and I every time I am drafting with people, they don't want to take him, and so I have a lot of thoughts about David Harris at this moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm getting that. It is interesting. The based on on where Cook was drafted and the reports on him, I think that the Gainwell situation has a really high 
bait and switch risk if you actually start to go all in on him. With Cook, I mean, I think the upside is a more interesting thing. And if he might actually have a couple of Dowling Cook like seasons, I just don't think they're going to play the backups. I mean, James Cook is separated from them so convincingly, but I guess there's less standalone value. And that's than- what well, so we had this conversation on ship chasing last night. And that's what I said there was if you're this out on Damian Harris, then you should be taking Cook in the sixth round. Like, I mean, and and getting him on in a lot of drafts. And and if you if that's your position, Sean, I know you're very high on Cook, then that makes sense. I think that makes sense. That's a way to play it. But if you're also tiptoeing around James Cook, then I think you have to be willing to mix in some exposure to Harris. We are back on the clock. Gainwell goes one pick before us. We don't get to grab him. You have Roshan Johnson, Kendrick Miller at the top of the queue. I take a lot of both of those rookies. You also have a bunch of QBs in there. The one that I'm not thrilled about is Kyler. We can talk about a little bit more. Um, what are you thinking here? I guess I would go with Kendra and Roshan. I, keeping up with what the Saints are doing with their running backs is uh, a it's little bit hard. of a headache. Yeah, <laughs> but ah, uh, I yeah, mean, let's do it. Are we comfortable that that Kareem Hunt is is not the thing now with the Saints? I mean, even if he shows up, are we that worried? I mean, they didn't they didn't sign him right away. They don't. I, that seemed more like a reaction to Eno Benjamin getting hurt and not having enough bodies early in the season. And then Hunt probably realizing that and deciding, you know what, I don't want to sign here because I'm not actually going to play <laughs> and, and and taking off. Um, yeah, I mean, if you can get in with the Indianapolis Colts right now, I uh, <laughs> there are some very concerning elements there with Jonathan Taylor. I mean, I don't. It seems like Jonathan Taylor could take this farther than than Josh Jacobs. It seems like both of those guys could. I there do seem to be some like mildly positive rumors about J.K. Dobbins, which is one of the reasons why I keep taking him, or at least his head coach is just nudging in that direction. Like, I think Dobbins is going to be back. Why wouldn't he? He's healthy and he needs to play. He's under contract. <laughs> We're not going to give him more money. He'll probably come back, right? So we'll see how that all works out. So we have here at QB some options. We have Purdy set up. We have Pickett set up. We have Sam Howell set up. You can take Desmond Ritter with Kyle Pitts, Pitts. and I like that. I've been making the case that, I mean, Justin Fields is a really good pick this year. He's one of my favorite picks, at least in some ways, in some context. The gap in price between Fields and Ritter is much larger (laughs) than the gap in how they project to score. And I mean, a lot of drafts Ritter is not even going. And so you're getting a guy potentially who is going to have low roster numbers. And I mean, one of the things that you're not really supposed to do then is to select these guys at the very end. And so, I mean, I kind of feel like a lot of the best drafters are also not going to have him. So I mean, if you're in on Pitts, if you're in on Drake London, uh, I was chatting with JJ the other day, and, and he was making the point that you have made, and he actually referenced you uh, about the RPOs and the fact that, I mean, you can be high on those two guys and still think Desmond Ritter will just be good. But the thing that I try and <laughs> make sure I mention from time to time is that Ritter's EP numbers last year at the end of the season were fine. I would expect them to rise with an off season to practice. I would expect them to rise with Kyle Pitts in there as another weapon. I don't think that Kyle Pitts can have the type of season where we win with him on our roster and Desmond Ritter (laughs) not be very fantasy viable. I like the fact that we have multiple guys set up here and especially maybe in that scenario, I can understand why you would be out on Kyler. You're out on him beyond that though. Yeah. I just think the more I think through him, especially in best ball, you don't know how many games he's going to play. I, I do think they're going to have some offensive changes. And returning from an ACL, we're probably not going to get the same type of mobility and rushing that like has always given him the upside. So it feels like, okay, yeah, like this is a cheap way to actually get a dual threat profile and a lot of rushing. He will move some. But, I mean, if you look at even just not mobile quarterbacks, but like vaguely mobile ones, like a, a good example is Joe Burrow. Came back from his ACL in 2022 and played the whole year and threw well and was successful in all of those things didn't really run a lot last year in 2023 he had more than double the um rushing yards more than double the rushing tds 
His designed run rate more than doubled. The scramble rate stayed about the same or, or I think went slightly up, but the design run rate more than doubled. They you know, did some stuff with him. And, and so he went from 40 attempts in 16 games to 75 rush attempts in 16 games and was more efficient on those rushes. Kyler's a totally different animal. I think, you know, if he's back on the field at all from his ACL, he's going to run some, but I just think you're looking at probably missing some games. And then when he gets back, probably not actually rushing that much and not having the same upside. And this, the market hates this team. You look at the look ahead lines, the Vegas lines, their over under win total right now is 4.5. It's two full wins below every other team in the NFL. Like if I want to bet on Kyler to, to come back and do some good things, I would just want to put a huge bet on the, on the Cardinals to go over four and a half wins. That feels like a, like a really easy way to bet on, the, on to bet on Kyler. But um, the fact that I don't feel comfortable, you know, going out and putting this huge bet on them to go over four and a half wins is because I don't really feel that comfortable with Kyler playing eight games and, and actually being mobile and actually being a, a difference making player that's going to score fantasy points. So, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like he's a little bit fool's gold, to be honest. We are, we just got on the clock here. Um, looks like you have Ty J Spears at the top of the queue. Can he pick it? I don't take a lot of Spears, but pick it. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for this build. And I'm fine with Spears. I don't have a strong argument against him or another name. To, to I mean, Jerome Ford is lower in our queue and is somebody that I do take it a, a little bit of, but he left practice yesterday with a hamstring. I think it was with something. Yeah. I talked Pete into taking him in our most recent best ball banana stand draft. And yet the more I thought about that, when they're saying week to week and they're hoping he's ready for week one, that could be a little bit of a problem. What do you think on Zamir white? You think that Josh Jacobs is going to hold out? I think white becomes, I think they might sign someone else. If he does, I don't, I think white might be fool's gold too. So let's go Spears. I know you like him a lot. I'm, th- I'm fine taking him. We've, we've taken a, I feel like we take him at every draft we do together, Sean, but um, we got to get your fine. exposure up. That's right. We got to get my exposure up. Uh, yeah. On Zamir white, they have such a thin running back room. They haven't really added anyone. They still have just Zamir white, Amir Abdullah are the two that are splitting first team reps. They have um, Brandon Bolden still there as sort of their, their other guy. Um, if Josh Jacobs actually holds out, that's where somebody like Kareem Hunt lands right before week one. And then they play. And because they didn't trust Zamir White at all last year. The fact that Josh Jacobs was able to get 390 something touches is because they, you know, their backups combined for like 30 something. It was not, I mean, Zamir White had 17 carries and no targets last year and was active for most of the season should have been sort of their main backup, but they didn't really use him at all. He's one of those players where it's like, yeah, you look at the depth chart, the starters holding out, you look at the depth chart, you go, Oh, Zamir white's kind of interesting. Let's take him. But then you think through his profile a little bit and you go, they didn't really trust him at all last year. The same coaching staff is there. They don't have any depth behind them. They're obviously hoping that they get Josh Jacobs back, that they get his contract settled, whatever they get him to take a deal like Saquon where they throw a couple extra million in incentives on there. And then he comes back. And if he doesn't, that Zamir white isn't just the next answer. It's very clear. They don't really have a next answer and they're going to have to think about it a little bit. It's sort of the way that I look at it. Yeah. That's definitely a potential landing spot for someone. I do think that maybe there's more upside than the scenario would indicate. This was a tricky one, right? Because we're generally, even with late round picks, we're looking for guys where most of the information is pointing in the same direction. The thing that I think is interesting about these former Georgia backs, you look at White, you look at James Cook. One of the things with James Cook, maybe not playing as much last season as you would guess, even though his peripherals were fantastic. I mean, that raises a little bit of an eyebrow. You tend to think, back to them at Georgia and you're like, well, the reason those guys didn't have superstar lines is because they were playing together and cannibalizing each other. But then you look at their peripherals in college there and granted, you know, playing against the sec defenses, is not going to maybe allow for as much as some of their backs playing in, even though they're power conferences, weaker conferences, but the peripheral is actually not great for white, especially. And then for cook, but one of the things with white, he had some of the injuries in college. He was this mega prospect, this mega recruit and then 
he gets to the combine. He tests extremely well. He's a size speed guy. And so if they can create some of the space there, if they're looking to exploit some of the things that the Chiefs are looking to exploit. I mean, you think about size speed guys who maybe didn't have great peripherals. Zamir White is still like a thousand percent better than Isaiah Pacheco, who's starting running back for their divisional rival. <laughs> if they can create some of those kinds of things, the opportunity is there. You know, you read the camp reports on him and the team and the team observers are saying he looks night and day different. He looks faster. He's ready to go this season. You know, if they need him, he's going to be a useful piece as opposed to last year, where, as you say, they didn't take Josh Jacobs off the field. So I think that one could go in either direction, but there are, there are red flags there. There's no question. Yeah, I think that's a good case though. I mean, I, I don't know why, like for instance, Tajay Spears is that much different. And, and even if Josh Jacobs comes back, then Zamir White's in probably I'm saying that if Jacobs holds out, they might sign somebody. But if Jacobs comes back, they they're sort of seeming to indicate that they're okay with where they're at with the same sort of backups. And then it feels a little bit like the Tajay Spears play behind Derrick Henry. It's, and you know, as well as you know, the things you were just saying, but that's there's yeah, there's probably not much. I mean, talk about a 15th round pick. It's not like there's there's a lot of running backs at this point that have clear pads or anything like that. We have moved into this range now. We're about on the clock for 16, 17. We have three total picks left. We are at a one, five, seven, two. Because of how late we got started with our second running back, I mean, I would be fine with this being a two, seven, seven, two, but there are some interesting names at tight end, more so than at running back. When we're not exactly loaded up on QB, we could be a three QB build. Really, we just want to take the best players that we think are going to add here and not worry too much about the structure. Howell is here. Ritter is here. The next running back down, I think, would be Chase Brown, even though there are some things there. Which direction would you like to go? I, I think take the QBs, yeah. At this point, we got to get, um, get the QBs built out. Is that, I mean, what other QBs are even available? Well, I don't it's think that thin. we would be looking at anybody other than the ones we could. Yeah, I just wondering if there's cover to try to get Ritter in the 18th. But yeah, let's just, let's just take, take Ritter here and then we'll take, we'll do, we'll do a three, six, seven, two. We'll take a running back maybe at the end of the 18th. And one of the reasons why I think that probably will work is that we've had some reporting that Chris Evans is ahead of Chase Brown, which, I guess doesn't worry me at all because we already know that Evans. I mean, I have plenty of enthusiasm for Travion who you could argue was probably more buried than Evans was. And yet, I mean, Travion was a good college player. He seemed to be the guy who was second in line before he got hurt. Brown is more similar to Evans, but with the collegiate track record, it's one of these deals where they've said glowing things about him all throughout the off season for him to be behind Evans at this point in camp doesn't mean very much to me at all. You'd love for, to have him ahead, but I mean, Brown is the guy out of all their players, including Joe Mixon, who could be an impact running back. If those reports are going to push him to us with the very last pick in the draft, then, you know, I, I will definitely take that. We're also going to get some other options that we like in I mean, Pierre Strong. We can select or we can fade because we already have Stevenson. I've taken some Dwayne McBride at the end of drafts. Sean Tucker is still in a battle to even make the team, but I think he's the one back for the Buccaneers who, if there's someone who actually emerges as a legitimate starting back, it would be him. Probably not Rashad white. I don't think anybody is going to there. I don't think they're going to create fantasy points for the running backs. It sounds like Baker Mayfield is on the verge of losing the camp battle to Kyle Trask, which probably tells you all you need to know about what they're going to be other than garbage dump offs to Evans and Godwin, which again, I think plays into our thesis for those guys. And then Ben, at the end of all these drafts, you can, you can never go wrong with Michael Mayer, Trey McBride and Hunter Henry. The, the holy triumvirate of late uh, tight ends, but we do have Pitts and Frymuth, and probably with Jalen Warren as our QB2 are in 
running back mode for this one. I've taken a decent amount of McBride in the 18th round, probably one of my bigger uh, exposures. I mean, certainly the combination of him and, and Ty Chandler, but Chandler has now gotten more expensive. But um, I mean, just uh, you know, to, to play against Alexander Madison, it, it feels you know fairly easy to do there. Chase Brown does go. And then, yeah, Pierre Strong's a guy I still think, you know, you can play into the sort of size of the hit. Um, what would the payoff be? Excitement level. Um, where it does seem like the Patriots might sign somebody before week one, but still, if that player is basically a little bit washed up and is coming in so late... Oh, but we have Ramondre on this team. We don't want to. We don't want to do Pierre. We're, we're going to be betting against Ramondre. Um, and one of the things I mentioned from time to time is that the stack explorers do suggest that. The you click RB2, on just the running backs. That the RB two opposite your receiver there can be a you, play that works out pretty nicely. We have Justin Jefferson, so I think adding a little more Minnesota would. What be do you think about McBride? We do have Jefferson on this team. We took Dobbs. We have a little bit in that game versus like these other guys, basically. I, I'm i with you on not betting against Ramondre. I don't have a name that I think is anybody who really would push us off of McBride. So it seems like a pretty straightforward pick for our final selection here. So then we do take McBride as our final pick. That gives us a roster of Kenny Pickett, Sam Howell, Desmond Ritter at QB. I like the way that they complement each other, especially when we have their receiving weapons set up at running back Ramondre Stevenson, Jalen Warren, Rashawn Johnson, Kendra Miller, Ty J Spears. We're very excited about the rookies. And then Dwayne McBride adds on the final player with that. At wide receiver, Justin Jefferson, T Higgins, Brandon Ayuk, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. Jahan Dotson and Rashad Bateman. Then with Romeo playing opposite Justin Jefferson as our last player and Kyle Pitts, Pat Fryermuth at tight end. Uh, this is maybe my favorite wide receiver group of any of the drafts that I've done. I like having the stud tight ends with them. I like having those upside QBs. And then Ben, this is a zero RB roster, you want to say modify, you want to say what have you. We took Ramondre and then no one else until pick 121. This feels like the blueprint for winning underdog in 2023. <laughs> well, I certainly hope you are right about that. Um, it is a fun team. I like the, you know, we've talked about ways to do the late round QB thing. We've done some drafts with late round QBs and late round tight ends. And this one we take two pretty premium tight ends or at least stacking them together a lot of capital at tight end in addition to a lot of capital at wide receiver it's why our second running back didn't come until the 120s and yet i mean if Ramondre is the guy if he gives you that anchor and if you know late round quarterback is viable this year which is something we believe it is and we played three different quarterbacks and we stacked them all and we have bring backs on all of them Except for, I guess, Ritter, Pitts, we don't have it. Oh, no, we have Roshan Johnson. So, yeah, yep, we have we a little – we have a bring back on all those potential games in Week 17. Obviously, part of the, the idea of, you know, doing three stacks is helping you in 15 and 16 as well. But, yeah, I mean, if Stevenson can be a star, an RB1 overall type, or at least contending, you know, being in the top three – hitting on his ceiling in a way that, you know, consistently hits our lineup. We have the receiver depth. We have the tight ends to, to put up points there. We have three late round quarterbacks, all stacked. Like we're saying that, I mean, hopefully that can also match. That's one of the light spots, obviously. And then it just becomes a thing of, can these rookies do it for us in, in, in the RB2 spot? I mean, we have Jalen Warren. He's a second year guy, but then Roshan Johnson, Kendra Miller, Tajay Spears, a lot of youngsters. If we can get, some usable scores out of those guys. Oh, and Dwayne McBride. 
at the end, right? So if we can get some usable scores out of these guys, um, that RB2 spot becomes obviously, you know, it's easy, I think, to look at that, and some of the listeners will hear that and say, well, you're not going to get any points at RB2 some weeks, and we might not. <laughs> we might not. But the thing is, you can still score enough points everywhere else to, to stay alive is, frankly, the reality of it when you build this way. It's a, it is a, a very – you know, zero RB-ish type of draft. We've done this type of thing before, certainly, Sean, where we're basically throwing away that RB2 spot. Um, not, I wouldn't say throw it away. We, we, we've drafted some upside players, but we are taking a lot of risk, let's put it that way, for low scores, but also knowing that we've built in the potential for some really big scores everywhere else. And hopefully, even if we get a few of those low scores at RB2, we're able to to make up the ground everywhere else. And we were very intentional about the types of backs that we took and where we took them. There is plenty of risk when you are drafting a bunch of rookie running backs. It may be sound counterintuitive, but for a lot of these rookies, you're actually better off selecting them early. The guys who are locked in stars, who you know are going to play, and they give you that uncertain upside. Then to try and take a lot of them late, where it's very easy for them to get benched, or really they're just looking on to the next season. You think about Samir White and what he did to teams last year were I mean, it's not just that you're not getting points. You're not getting any points. And yet when you look at the specific players we took, Jalen Warren fits in with our Steelers Seahawks game and his numbers last year. You can throw in the eyeball test if you want so much better than Najee Harris, a very real chance that he ends up as the starting running back there by mid season. It seems strange to say that about someone like Najee Harris, and obviously he's been better than Clyde Edwards-Alaire, but Clyde Edwards-Alaire, despite the embarrassment that it gives the Chiefs to have selected him over Jonathan Taylor and those other guys, he's now fallen completely out of the mix at Kansas City. You could have Warren, if he keeps playing so well, go ahead of Najee Harris, who is limiting that Steelers offense. The reports on Roshan have been... I wouldn't say mix. I think the reports have actually been favorable for all of the Bears running backs. Many of the things early in camp suggested the two guys competing for the starting position were Herbert and Foreman, and yet they're saying Johnson may be the best pass blocker and may be his route to getting on the field. We know he's got elite intangibles. His evasion rate and some of those peripherals last year were one of the things that made him such a trendy guy in the draft. If he ends up as the Bears starter, that would not be a surprise. Kendra Miller, someone who is in love with himself, which is a great first step. And then he was fantastic for TCU last year. Hopefully he gets that audition early and never really lets it go. Tajay Spears, again, elite peripherals, fantastic evasion rate for a smaller guy. You've got some speed. You've got some pass catching. It looks like they're going to give him standalone value. And then Dwayne McBride had the best evasion rate of any player in college football last year. Yes, it was against a much lower level of competition, which is why you can get him in the very last pick, but you're talking about guys who come in with profiles that in many ways I would argue are better than tank Bigsby, better than Zach Charbonnet, those guys much more expensive when you're getting discounts on some of these players, when you're getting them in areas of the draft that makes sense. And then you're putting a lot of them together. We don't need every one of them to hit. If a couple of them do and Stevenson hits, this team is going to be very difficult to beat. I think that we have more of a concern probably with the ultimate upside of the quarterbacks than we actually do with the running back position. Yeah, I think I'm with you there. The quarterback position became one that we pushed very, very late. But we got three guys that we do like. And I have built Kenny Pickett, Sam Howell, Desmond Ritter teams before. So let's hope that that trio works because I have a few, more than a few in my in my um, group of, of drafts so far. So, uh, Sean, this is portfolio is the word I was trying to come up with. That we use in this industry for that, John. This I like is a lot of I fun. like group of teams. Group of teams is another yeah. way to say it. I mean, I, I explained that incredibly well. My kids would have understood it. <laughs> but yeah, this was a blast. Uh, excited to to get into. I'm excited to get into the main events. Get into a little bit of longer clocks. Have some more time to talk through it. It is tough with these 30 second clocks on Underdog for us to really get to talk through the decisions and the various ways we might want to go. For me to tell you that I need you to click on some other position so I can even see who's available and things like that. But um, a, a fun draft. I, I do really like the final team. Yeah, this turned out really well. As you mentioned, we're going to be doing an FFPC main event with Pat and Pete next week. 
that will be awesome. We have the 106 will be there in the middle. We'll be able to get uh, fallers. We'll be able to take our guys without having to reach a full round as you do occasionally at the edges. Uh, again, I, I think we may have won the 3 million here. We're going to win the 1 million <laughs> next week. I mean, we can split the millions in, in enough ways to, to make it still effective for everyone. I want to wish everybody a great weekend. I hope you're enjoying the preseason games. We actually get some football. I can't wait. Appreciate you guys listening. in. Uh, this will be the end of our early August underdog special edition of Stealing Bananas. I'm Sean Siegel. With me, as always, is Ben Gretsch. I mentioned his ranking post is coming out. Make sure you subscribe over there so you get that. I'm going to have articles basically every day, Ben, looking at some dynasty, looking at how to play the main event, looking at more little hacks. I'm kind of parceling out my underdog hacks throughout draft season. So I had another piece of that recently. You guys know where to sign up. Also, I just want to thank everyone again who's left a rating and review. That helps us so much. Oh, we just did underdog. The coupon code there is Rotoviz, 100% match up to $100. Then you are going to be writing about the mastiff coming up so subscribers can be looking forward to that the the huge double up slash big payday contest for underdog that'll be some content that people also won't want to miss i'm looking forward to uh grilling you on your team there you got that thousand dollar entry you know no mistakes no mistakes so anyway we love you guys (laughs) talk to you soon